Our webinar today will discuss brain tumor treatment therapy updates. My name is Jelan Demas. I'm a senior program manager here at the American Brain Tumor Association. I'm delighted to introduce our speaker today, Dr. Suzanne Chang. Dr. Chang has been a speaker at past ABTA patient and family conferences. Dr. Chang is the director of the Division of Neuro-Oncology at the University of California, San Francisco. Her interest is in the care of patients with central nervous system tumors and in the development of novel treatments. She also has an interest in novel imaging of brain tumors, quality of life of patients, and caregiving. Thank you so much for joining us, Dr. Chang. You may now begin your presentation. Thank you very much. It is really such a great um, privilege to be here to share uh, this information with everyone, and I would like to welcome you as well. Um, I'd also like at this time to thank the ABTA for all their efforts and dedication to the education and support of our brain tumor community. Uh, they've asked me to talk about uh, brain tumor therapy update. And we all know that the major modalities for treatment for our patients include surgery, radiation, and drug therapy, uh, usually chemotherapy. But what I would like to share with you today is very exciting strategies to try to improve upon our current treatment. And the many different approaches include, for example, how can we incorporate adjuncts to improve the maximal safe resection of the tumors? How can we improve the delivery of drugs and novel agents into the brain? Because we recognize that the brain is a privileged environment uh, where there is a blood-brain barrier that often prevents a lot of drugs from getting into the brain tissue. Are there ways we can do better at optimizing radiation treatment, sort of focusing tumor treatment to tumors and sparing as much normal tissue as possible? We, are, we know that radiation and chemotherapy with temozolomide, for example, is a standard treatment for glioblastoma. But can we add a new therapy to that treatment uh, that might help with uh, improving the outcome? More and more we're understanding about selecting patients based on molecular and cytogenetic parameters so that we can develop what we call precision medicine and individualized treatments specifically to patient populations that we hope are going to benefit uh, and spare ineffective treatments from other patients. Targeted therapies and tumor stem cell population as targets as, or the microenvironment as well as immunotherapy strategies, these are all approaches that are being currently evaluated. So what I'd like to do with you in the next hour or so to, is to go over how some of these adjuncts and some of these strategies are being used um, in the current therapy. Now for brain tumor surgery, how much tumor can be removed is really determined by the size of the tumor and where it's located in the brain. And what I show you here are two examples. Um, the first, and you can see here with my cursor, that this tumor is involving both sides of the brain at the back of the brain. This level here of this MRI is at the level where here at the bottom of the eyes. And you can see that this tumor is, is very um, infiltrative and involves both sides, making it fairly difficult then to consider a maximal resection of this type of a tumor. On the other hand, you have a patient with a tumor that is fairly well circumscribed in a location that can be removed safely. And you have the preoperative scan here as well as the postoperative scan showing the resection of the mass. So maximal safe resection in the brain has certainly improved over the years with image-guided capability as well as cerebral cortical mapping. And that is trying to determine the location of very sensitive areas of the brain that have specific function. There are several ways that this can be done. The first is functional imaging using what we call magnetoencephalography. And this is an example of a patient who is placed within the scanner. And sensations are applied to the patient and we're looking to pick up within the MRI scan here very, very small changes 
that we can depict the pathways of these various um, either motor function or sensory function within the brain. So what you can see here is a patient, and this is a tumor here, in the front part of the left part of the brain. And what we're trying to do is to identify where the uh, motor function might be to, so that the surgeon, when he goes in for surgery, can stay away from those areas to allow for maximal safe resection without any adverse effects on the patient. There are also non-invasive imaging techniques. This one is called diffusion tensor MRI. This is often done preoperatively on our patients. And you can see here what this identifies are pathways that may be very close to the tumor. Here's the example of the tumor. And these are the pathways that would innervate the muscles of the shoulder or the wrist. Now, what's important to realize is that the um, brain is a connective tissue with what has a lot of networks. And so even though it may the, the sensation or the motor um, function might start out at the periphery, these pathways do go through all the way what we call subcortically down into the brain stem, all the way down into the spinal cord and then out into the nervous system to innervate the muscles, for example, the shoulder and the wrist. And so we need to be able, the surgeon needs to be able to identify these pathways because you don't want to be able to damage these at the time of surgery because that would then result in potentially weakness, for example, in this case of a motor pathways. Intraoperatively, there are very sophisticated techniques that can be used to identify specific areas of the brain that have function. And what you're seeing here is actually the intraoperative image of a patient who is undergoing speech mapping. And what you see here are actually electrodes that are placed on different locations in the brain. And the patient is usually kept awake to test the areas of language function. And so these little, these little numbers here that are actually on paper are identifying specific areas where language function may or may not be located. And this, again, gives the surgeon a really nice map of the function of the language so that they can then go in and operate on areas safely. Another technique is using intraoperative MRI. And you can see how this would be very valuable in terms of assessing real time what extent of resection has been performed. And if there are areas of tumor that are left behind at the time of surgery, this really saves the, 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 the possibility of having the patient to have to come back for another operation. So this gives the surgeon real-time information about the extent of resection. And a lot of institutions have intraoperative MRI as a particular technique to help with maximal safe resection. And lastly, what I'd like to review is the use of a specific fluorescent dye called 5-ALA. And this is used in glioma resection. This particular dye is preferentially taken up by the tumor cells and not by the normal brain. And using a special filtered light, the surgeon can actually visualize directly, intraoperatively, the presence of tumor cells. And what you're seeing here is white light. This is at the base of a resection cavity. Um, these areas here are where the blood vessels have been cauterized or, or blocked off. And this is at the end of the surgery where the surgeon thinks, you know, I think I've gotten all that I think I can get in terms of tumor that I can appreciate. This patient received this drug prior to surgery. It's a one-time dose. It's very safe. And following ingestion of this dye, what happens is that the tumor cells take up the dye. And when violet blue light is used, the, the surgeon can actually visualize these areas that are fluorescing and sort of point to areas that he needs to now go in and try to remove safely. And so this gives him, again, the surgeon, real-time information about where tumor is located and whether um, any residual cells are there. So this is a very exciting tool that's being used uh, now in a lot of clinical trials to try to optimize safe resection of um, the tumor. Now, one of the other um, challenges, of course, is how do we get drug encapsulated and delivered in a way that is 
more efficient. And one of the ways to do this is to allow for the cells to be, for the, for the drugs to be encapsulated into what we call this nanoparticle. And a nanoparticle is a very small uh, unit. It can be multifunctional in that it can be engineered so that it can allow for the nanoparticle to be tailored to the tumor itself. And you can actually embed within the nanoparticle drugs, for example, within the core. You can tag it with fluorescent markers. You can tag it with drugs. And this is one way, potentially, to deliver treatment into the brain, because we know that how we get drugs directly into the brain is a major challenge. And there are clinical trials where this type of technology is being used to take standard drugs that you know, can be used and put into these nanoparticles, allow for a longer distribution of the agent within the bloodstream or even directly into the brain so that we can allow for this sort of specific targeting of agents. If you look at drug delivery to the central nervous system, there are fairly um, different ways to do this. The first is uh, at the time of a surgical resection, what you see here is the implantation of a wafer. And uh, chemotherapy can be embedded into this wafer. In fact, carmustine wafers or gliadel wafers is one such therapy that's approved for patients with uh, glioblastoma. And so what you see here, here's the resection cavity. This is the brain here. And the wafer is placed directly in apposition to the brain tissue, allowing for the drug to penetrate directly into the brain tissue. You can also directly inject drug into the brain itself. You can administer drugs via the central uh, nervous system using the cerebrospinal fluid pathways, for example, directly into the ventricle. Or you can also deliver drugs using a catheter and a pressure gradient to deliver drugs called convection enhanced delivery, or CED. We can also use gene therapy to deliver drugs directly into the brain. And how gene therapy works is you take a, a, a virus or a, a, a vehicle, and you put in a therapeutic gene that you can then inject into the tumor cell. And this allows for the transduction of the gene directly into the tumor. That gene can have a cytotoxic or killing effect to the, the cell, and you end up with cell death. And so this idea of using a therapeutic gene to deliver um, this directly into the tumor is another strategy that is being explored. In fact, one of the agents that is being looked at is a adenovirus that transduces a specific gene. This gene is called cytosine deaminase. And it metabolizes flucytosine, which is really non-toxic to the normal cells. But the cells that are transduced are able to convert this benign drug, flucytosine, to a chemotherapeutic drug, 5-fluorouracil. And this is now done only in dividing cells because the adenovirus gets taken up by dividing cells. Normal cells in the brain are not expected to be transduced by the virus. And so what we do is we give the patient, and this is on this next slide, what happens is that if we inject this directly into the brain tumor, the virus infects the dividing cells in the cancer, it spreads through the tumor, and then we administer this agent, which is a pill, 5-fluorocytosine, and only the cells that have taken up the virus, and therefore the gene, can convert the 5-FC to the chemotherapy drug 5-FU. And so what you get is this very targeted killing of the tumor cells that have been transduced with the virus. And to date, this phase one trial is being done at several institutions. It's well tolerated. There is evidence that the gene is transduced and dose escalation continues. And the hope is that we can move forward with larger studies to evaluate this particular approach.
Now, I had mentioned convection enhanced delivery in passing, and what this is is basically being able to deliver drug into the brain using a catheter, but using a pressure gradient. So if we put gliadel wafers directly into the brain, for example, or with chemotherapy wafers, we're using active diffusion. So you're looking at concentration that's very high in the wafer, concentration that's low in the brain, and we're, we're allowing for this active diffusion process. But if you look at the distance from the source that you allow for by diffusion, it's fairly limited. And of course, we know that glioma are very infiltrative, and so ideally we want to get as much drug out into the parenchyma of the brain tissue as much as possible so that we can actually target the tumor cells. And the difference with convection-enhanced delivery is that you can really get a very high concentration of the drug in a very long distance from where you administer the actual uh, treatment. So here you have the catheter, and you can see that there is a larger distribution of the drug as a result of using this um, very sophisticated pressure gradient administration. Uh, Dr. Chris Bankowitz here at UCSF has really pioneered this type of work. And this is an example of using an animal model. This is actually a, a canine with a spontaneously arising uh, tumor. And this patient dog actually presented with a seizure, a very common symptom that our patients present with. And you can see on this MRI scan where the tumor is located. It's in the temporal lobe uh, within the brain. And what he's been able to do is to infuse drug with gadolinium. Gadolinium is what we use for MRI scans to, to visualize contrast enhancement. And you can actually see where the, tum where the drug is being administered in the tumor. And you can see that here. You get a good response. This tumor grew back and was treated. This, this patient dog was treated again. And you can see the very nice volume of distribution of the drug within the tumor that was uh, been able to accomplish. And you can see a nice response again following treatment. So this type of knowledge of where drug is going is so critical when we try to determine, did we get drug where we wanted it to go, and did it have an effect? And so this type of imaging real time is very important in assessing uh, whether we actually drug, got drug where we wanted it to go. And this is an example of um, how we're using that in our patients. So this is actually now a patient where we are injecting using a catheter. Here you see the catheter. And here is uh, where the drug is being infused directly into the tumor bed. And that's right in here. And we're using gadolinium to visualize where tumor is being administered where drug is being administered within the tumor. And so you can see that this technique has now come from the preclinical and animal modeling now to our patients. And so there are a number of studies that are able to use convection-enhanced delivery to deliver agents directly into the brain. Now, as we understand the pathways involved in tumor growth and death, how these tumors invade, how they form blood vessels. This is how we can provide rational targeting of glioma. And over the years, certainly in cancer, there's been a huge explosion of new drugs that have been pioneered because of understanding these pathways. This allows us to individualize the treatment that's based on the specific molecular abnormality of the tumor. And these signal transduction agents that are being tested, they're basically drugs that target a specific signal or switch of a pathway. And I think a lot of the work that has gone into, for example, the Cancer Genome Atlas project, uh, which was published in 2008, glioblastoma was chosen as the first cancer to comprehensively characterize using genomics. And what this showed us was that there were very key pathways that were present and you can see here, this is 88% of the time this pathway was altered. In 87% of the time, P53 was altered, and RB in 78%. So these pathways here tell us that they're critical for the formation of, for, of glioblastoma and gives us insight into potential targets. 
because if these pathways are relevant and important to drive tumor formation, perhaps by blocking some of these areas, we can then result into tumor regression and, and killing of the tumor. And so if we want to look at, in general, targeting growth factor receptors, and I often will draw this out for my patients when I see them in my clinic. You start off with a tumor cell here, and this is the nucleus of the cell. And this is where, really, it's called the machinery of the cell. It allows for gene transcription, and, and, and you have dividing cells, and you have you know, duplication of the nucleus, and that allows for daughter cells within the tumor. But on the surface of tumor cells, there are these proteins called receptors. This is a cell membrane growth factor receptor. And then out in the periphery, there are what we call ligands or proteins that bind to the receptor. And when this little triangle, this black triangle here, when that binds to this receptor, you get a signal. And the signal then gets transferred to the nucleus. And as a result of that, you get these messages that tell the cell to grow, not die, form blood vessels, or spread out. And so if we understand those pathways, we can understand some of the approaches that are being tested to target this. So the first one, for example, would be very simply to say, if this receptor is mutated on the surface of the cell, if we develop an antibody that would shut down this receptor, then that's a strategy. And for example, there are now antibodies, for example, to the epidermal growth factor receptor mutant that's being tested in both the upfront and the recurrent setting. Um, we can also use an antibody that will inhibit the proteins that are circulating out into the periphery. An example of this is bevacizumab. Bevacizumab is a monoclonal antibody that targets vascular endothelial growth factor. So that actually basically binds to the factor, preventing it from um, actually becoming attached to the receptor itself. There are many drugs that have been developed. These are called enzyme inhibitors. Those have to get into the cell. They have to get into the tumor cell for it to work because they work on the intracellular component of, this, of the tumor. And then there are many signaling inhibitors that might actually work on the gene transcription. I already spoke with you about adenovirus and putting gene therapy. So that's where this would work. So if we understand the basics of um, signaling pathways and opportunities to target them, we can understand how this field has really exploded in terms of targeting these various aspects of the pathway. So here we have dysregulated pathway epidural growth factor, PI3 kinase, histoacetylase, RB pathway, transforming growth factor, and numerous clinical trials. This, this is just a, a sort of a highlight of some of the targeted pathways, but it can go on and on in terms of some of the agents that are being tested in clinical trials. Targeting tumor blood vessels is another aspect, and I wanted to spend a little bit of time on this because, of course, um, we all are aware that Glioblastoma is a very vascular tumor. And it depends on these new blood vessels from forming within the tumor cells to allow them to grow and expand. We need to realize that this is a very complex um, pathway. What you have, what I'm showing you here, is the endothelial um, cells that line the blood vessels. And then around them, there are all of these uh, pro-angiogenic growth factors as well as endogenous inhibitors of angiogenesis. These are sort of the sort of balance between what drives tumors to form, blood vessels to form, versus those that prevent them from forming. And so you can see that targeting one area might not be the answer. We have to address the entire complex uh, pathways that are involved. So targeting tumor blood vessels, here is an example of a patient with a glioblastoma. And you can see here what, we, what I'm showing you are these very complex blood vessels. And this is really not normal blood vessels. These are tumor blood vessels. And we know that vascular endothelial growth factor is a key survival factor for these tumor blood vessels. And if we block vascular endothelial growth factor, 
what you see in the lab certainly is that these recently formed vessels just disintegrate. The smaller vessels regress. And what's normal blood vessels survive. And you can't form new abnormal blood vessels because it's restricted, it's inhibited. So this is a very um, important strategy for us to be testing. And indeed, the clinical trials of bevacizumab um, were done and showed these types of responses. This is from a paper um, by Creasel et al. in 2008 that shows the dramatic improvement in enhancement that you can see before and after bevacizumab treatment. And you can see the improvement of the mass effect and the pressure that um, because of the, the presence of this mass, you can see how things have normalized in terms of the midline and the structures look uh, much more normal. Now, because of these high response rates and the fact that time to progression at six months was improved to 30%, um, in May of 2009, the FDA approved bevacizumab as a single agent for patients with recurrent glioblastoma. When we see something that works with in, in recurrent glioblastoma, the obvious next step is, well, can we introduce this treatment earlier on in the course of the illness so that we can give patients more time, prevent the tumor from coming back for longer? And recent studies that were published this year, and I'll point to these two in the New England Journal, in the same issue of the New England Journal this year, uh, reported on two large international studies that looked at incorporating glio, um, bevacizumab for newly diagnosed glioblastoma uh, with temozolomide and radiation therapy. These studies were very similar in their results. There was not a survival benefit by using bevacizumab early on in the course of the illness. What it did show is that progression was prolonged. In other words, the time it took for the tumor to grow back was prolonged in the patients who received bevacizumab. Now, the big question, of course, is how does that benefit us? If that prevents symptoms, then that obviously is an important outcome. And that information is now being um, evaluated clear, uh, closely in terms of the true benefit. We know it did not give us a survival benefit, but it did prolong progression. And the question is, uh, what was quality of life also improved in these patients on bevacizumab? Uh, at this point, it's still not clear, though, that we should be giving every patient bevacizumab in the upfront setting with radiation and chemotherapy. Bevacizumab um, has also been used for radiation strategies. And there are two ways that bevacizumab can be incorporated into the care of our patients. The first is to protect the brain from prior radiation. And this was shown in patients who had very high doses of radiation, for example, with what we call the gamma knife or radiosurgery techniques. And what happens when you deliver these high doses of radiation is that the normal brain can cause necrosis or cell death within a normal tissue. And there were studies that have shown that if bevacizumab is used in patients who have this radiation damage, that this swelling and the inflammation that occurs because of the radi radiation can be decreased, and patients can actually function better. And you know that decadron is a very common drug we use in our patients because of the swelling that occurs in the brain. And what we, they found was that the bevacizumab can decrease the need for decadron in these patients and all the side effects that come along with decadron. All of this, of course, has to be balanced with the side effects of bevacizumab as well, which are well known in terms of high blood pressure and uh, potential risk of clotting, potential risk of bleeding. Um, all of these side effects have to be balanced in terms of looking at the benefit to decreasing the use of decadron. The other um, strategy is to protect the brain from planned radiation. And so what this means is that, as we all know, for a patient with glioblastoma, for example, radiation and chemotherapy is the standard. The radiation is usually six weeks in duration, Monday to Friday. And that's pretty much maximal radiation that the brain can handle. Radiation, we know, is an effective treatment. And when these tumors come back, the question is, does it make sense? 
to re-irradiate, to use a strategy that we know can be effective. Well, the downside of doing that, of course, is that you're radiating previously treated brain. And so the risk of radiation necrosis or damage to the brain goes, goes up. But if we can use bevacizumab in that situation, can we safely deliver more radiation to the brain? And so there are clinical trials that are specifically addressing this question of taking patients with recurrent glioblastoma who previously had the six week of radiation and to administer a shorter course of radiation with bevacizumab. And so these studies are ongoing and will be very interesting, I think, to see the results and whether we can incorporate this into our strategies for patients. Now, how tumors form is something that is still um, unclear. There is, of course, the literature that shows, the basic science literature that shows that you can retrieve stem cells from the tumor. And these stem cells tend to be very resistant to both radiation and chemotherapy. And so the recognition of the fact that the reason these tumors are so difficult to treat is because we're not targeting the tumor stem cells. And if we can therefore come up with strategies that are relevant in this particular group of cells, perhaps we can get a better approach in terms of targeting the tumor. And so these stem cells have different pathways that can be targeted, for example, the hedgehog pathway, the notch pathways. And a lot of work is being done to explore these populations of cells so that we can actually characterize them, understand what drives their growth, and then develop treatments that can block it. And so again, another strategy uh, targeting a specific st uh, population of cells within this very heterogeneous tumor. Now, we know that the uh, tumor exists within the brain, and the presence of the tumor allows for this microenvironment to be activated. And it can be not the tumor cells itself, but you can have angiogenesis, which we talked about, which is the blood vessels. You can have inflammation that occurs because of the presence of the tumor. We know these tumors invade and spread out. And so you have this very complex, again, signaling within the environment in the brain. And there are drugs now that are actually targeting these supportive cells because there's the idea that these cells actually promote tumor growth. And so rather than actually attacking the tumor, if we can attack the supportive cells, then perhaps that will have an effect on making the environment unfavorable for these tumor cells and allowing for these cells to be killed. So these clinical studies are ongoing, but looking at a different compartment within the brain, not just the tumor cells, but the tumor microenvironment. There are many other treatment approaches as well, and that's what's very exciting about the field of neuro-oncology right now. Here is one that is actually approved, which is alternating electrical field therapy. And the idea here is the knowledge that dividing cells can be susceptible to electrical fields that can cause disruption of the microtubule formation. The microtubules are these structures within the cells that allow for normal cell division. And so if you disrupt this, this means that the tumor cells cannot divide in a normal way, and the cells fall apart. So what this entails is insulated electrodes that are placed on the outside of the shaved scalp. You're connected to a portable um, tumor treating field that is generating this electrical field therapy. And there was a phase two trial, phase three trial that was published of um, 236 patients with recurrent glioblastoma. And they showed that there was no difference in outcome compared to standard treatment. Uh, but there were less side effects because you're not giving a, administering a systemic therapy. This is a very local treatment. And there is an ongoing phase three trial in patients with newly diagnosed glioblastoma that is evaluating the benefit of this strategy in patients. Other experimental treatment approaches, just to sort of round out the discussion about how we're thinking about moving forward with trying to bring new therapies to our patients. The use of neural stem cells, delivery of therapeutic agents, 
that um, are embedded within the neural stem cells. These can be converted to prodrugs that then get um, released into the tumor bed itself. Um, there's also, I think, most exciting are the immunotherapy trials. And this is based on some of the work that's been shown in melanoma and renal cell carcinoma. These are very, very difficult, resistant tumors. And yet still, immunotherapy strategies have been successful in that patient population. And the question of how do we take advantage of our immune system, this is something we, we all believe we can harness our own immune system to fight the tumor cells. And how can we do that um, in a way that gives us a benefit? There are nonspecific activation of the immune system using different proteins. Uh, there's activation of the cellular immune response because the immune system is a very complex system. There are, there are proteins that activate it or repress it. There are cells that are modulated that activate it or repress it. And so there are many different strategies to try to understand how we can harness this using antibodies directed at specific tumor proteins. And I already talked with you about the protein, the epidermal growth factor receptor mutant protein, and an antibody has been um, developed against the specific mutant protein. And this is a number of CELDEX trials that are going on both in the upfront setting as well as in the recurrent setting. And we have also other vaccines that take the heat shock protein that is unique to every patient's tumor, strips that off um, after surgery, and a vaccine is administered. This is an alliance protocol, which is a cooperative group protocol that's uh, funded by the NCI. And this trial is ongoing at many institutions as well. So if you look at uh, immunotherapy, and this is just a review of you know, the, the different components of the immune system, just to give you an idea of how complex it is, but opportunities for targeting. So we have the cellular components of it uh, in terms of dendritic cells and myelosuppressive cells, tumor-associated macrophages. These are all the cells that have, we talked about in the, in the uh, microenvironment. Uh, we have the normal T cells, regulatory T cells, and then you get the um, natural killer cells as well as the uh, various uh, other T cells, CD4, CD8 cells. And so what you have is this very, very complex uh, patterns that are developed not only in the production of various proteins, but also some of these cells. And so a lot of work is trying to understand how can we prime the cells that attack the tumor? How do we repress the ones that are inhibiting you know, the effects of immune system? And so there are many, many different approaches that are being explored. And this is, I think, very exciting uh, for the brain tumor community. Here is an example of the kinds of vaccine components that could be generated. Uh, you can actually take the actual tumor cell and use the killed tumor cell and vaccinate patients. That's been done. You can purify antigens from the tumor cells and give that back and use that as a vaccine. You can use dendritic cells. So dendritic cells are cells that we all have in our body. Um, they're very, very robust immune cells. And what happens in this situation is that you take the dendritic cells out from the patient, you prime it with tumor antigens, and you give those cells back to the patient. And those cells are like really just so primed to go in and target the tumor cells and get to where the tumor is. And then there are other ways to using the um, sort of gene therapy approach to um, immunize the patient using these plasmids that can also be another approach in terms of tumor vaccine. Antibodies is another one um, that can be used. And this is many different types of approaches, either um, antibodies that are tagged, for example, with radionuclide um, uh, that can be used, um, for example, here. Uh, you can use antibodies that target specific proteins within the actual uh, cell, on the surface of the cell. So you can see, again, multiple, multiple ways of thinking of how we can use antibodies and immunotherapy to target the tumor. So um, in summary, I just wanted to share with you some of the exciting work that's being done by many dedicated basic scientists, translational scientists, and clinicians to try to improve upon the standard modalities that we have today, that is radiation, surgery, and chemotherapy, standard chemotherapy drugs. 
uh, the continued need for the advancement in understanding the scientific basis of gliomal formation is really what will give us the tools to um, identify targets for better treatment. As we learn about the molecular biology of these tumors and the cytogenetics of the tumors, what drives these tumors, this is going to be very important to translate this to the clinic. How do we identify the patients who might best benefit from our treatments? How do we make um, these treatments personalized and precision uh, medicine as opposed to just treating every patient as if they were all the same? And I think the, the number and variety of clinical trials that I have shared with you today reflect this ongoing cooperative and multidisciplinary effort that is so critical to improve the outcomes of our patients and provide a hope for a cure. I mean, this is where we're all working so hard to try to understand the tumor and bring the therapies to our patients as quickly as we can. So what's on the horizon? I think through collaboration of scientists and clinicians, we're understanding how brain tumors form by integrating science and new technologies and the help of patients like all of you who are listening today, as well as the advocacy groups like the ABTA, the hope is we can develop new treatment strategies for patients and, and decrease side effects of therapy, ultimately improving quality of life as well. So with that, I'd like to thank you all for listening and participating. And I'll hand it back over to Joanna. Hey, thank you so much, Dr. Chang. That was a wonderful overview of different treatments. And we do have some questions that were sent earlier, as well as some that are coming in right now. So um, we will take as many as we have time for. Uh, the first one is a question about what is the likely success of the inhibiting of the IDH mutation? That's a really good question. Um, so for people on the line, the IDH mutation is a mutation that's seen in about 80% of low-grade glioma patients. Uh, and about 5 to 10% of glioblastoma, you can see this mutation. Um, and this mutation is one that is the hallmark of low-grade glioma. So if you see it in a glioblastoma patient, it's probably because their tumor started off as a low-grade tumor and then transformed into a high-grade tumor. The IDH mutation is unique to the tumor cell. And what happens when you have this mutation is that the pathways that would normally be important for glucose metabolism gets changed. And you have the production of what we call a brand new oncometabolite. So we're now talking metabolism and cancer. Uh, so this oncometabolite is called 2-hydroxyglutarate. 2-hydroxyglutarate is thought to affect a number of the genetic control mechanisms within the cell. What is interesting about IDH mutation is if you look at populations of patients with low-grade glioma who either have IDH mutation or don't have it, what seems to be the, the, the trend is that IDH mutation is is a good prognostic factor. In other words, having IDH mutation um, means that those patients tend to have a better outcome than patients who don't, whose tumors don't have the mutation. And we don't understand why that is. We don't understand the true mechanism for why IDH confers a better prognosis to patients. But what is clear is that this is, this is an important, very early abnormality. In other words, every cell within the tumor has this mutation. And so since it's a unique mutation only found within the tumor cells, I think everybody is very excited as to how can we harness that and target that, um, either with um, drugs that target IDH mutation. And there are now clinical trials that are being initiated to use drugs that inhibit uh, cells that have the IDH mutation. So I think that this is a great biomarker of tumor burden. In other words, only tumor cells have the mutation. And so if we can uh, target that particular mutation within the cells, I think this is potentially very promising. 
how we get those cells, those treatments directly into the tumor, distributed to every cell. That's always a challenge, as we've talked about and uh, reviewed today in the, in the webinar. But I think it's a very exciting finding that was uh, discovered and gives us more insight into the biology of the tumor. Thank you. Uh, a two-part question. Uh, people are asking about um, kind of other types of tumors. So um, is the treatment that you're talking about effective in metastatic brain tumors? And also um, others are asking about giant cell glioblastoma. Okay, so let's um, talk about metastatic brain tumors. Um, as you can tell from my talk today, I've focused on gliomas. Uh, this is primary brain tumors, uh, but metastatic brain tumors are far more common when you think about patients who are afflicted with brain tumors in general. And that's because cancer like breast cancer, lung cancer, uh, these cancers, systemic cancers, are far, far more common than brain tumors. The incidence of glioblastoma, for example, um, is you know, 15,000, 10 to 15,000 a year, as opposed to hundreds of thousands a year of um, other cancers. And so because these tumors can spread to the brain, uh, what you have is a metastatic group of patients whose primary tumors did not start in the brain, came from, from somewhere else. And so the therapies I've talked to you about today, for example, surgery. Uh, in metastatic brain tumors, they tend to have multiple brain tumors that are spread out into the brain because these cancer cells get into the bloodstream and then spread out. So they can spread out to the liver, the lung, for example, that came from the breast, and into the brain. So surgery may not be uh, an important strategy if there are multiple brain tumors because you can't take them all out, but actually, Surgery has been shown to be very effective if there's a dominant single metastasis. In other words, if there's a single tumor that is spread out from the uh, breast or lung, um, surgery has been shown to be effective in terms of even survival. And so surgery, certainly. Radiation is also important. And this is where uh, whole brain radiation treatment or radiosurgery is used. Um, so definitely radiation therapy is very important for the treatment of patients with metastatic brain tumors. Now when it comes to chemotherapy or drug treatments, you have to think that you have to understand the biology of the original tumor. So targeting the, the different pathways are specific to that original tumor. But if we understand the biology um, of those cancers, just the way we're understanding the biology of glioblastoma, for example, then you can understand how targeting it can be very similar. So I'll give you an example. Uh, melanoma uh, has been recently been shown to have a specific mutation called BRAF. And drugs were, tar were developed to target that mutation. And as a result, we now have agents that are approved for the use of metastatic, uh, in the use of metastatic uh, melanoma patients. So what I try to review with you today is sort of a broad strokes understanding of the biology of the cancer cell. The actual pathways that would need to be targeted would be specific to the type of tumor we're dealing with. So for example, when you talk about metastatic brain tumor, that's a very, very global, general description of multiple types of cancers. Uh, so you really have to understand the biology, original biology of the, um, of the, of the tumor that it started out from. Now, giant cell glioblastoma, um, we don't distinguish the treatment of giant cell glioblastoma uh, from glioblastoma. So this is a grade 4 histology. It's still called a grade 4 tumor. And so radiation and chemotherapy are still being used um, with temozolomide. But I think a lot of work is being done to say, does the giant cell glioblastoma have specific cytogenetic molecular um, parameters that are unique to it that can give us insight into targeting that specific population of cells. Great, thank you. A um, couple of people are asking about the modified polio virus that the young lady was treated at at Duke. Um, any thoughts on that story? 
uh, that's a really good question. So, you know, that's why I put in about the adenovirus um, way of delivering treatment. So in this case, the poliovirus itself is being used to try to attack the tumor cells. And um, I think like any clinical trial that is uh, being done, to get to clinical trial, you have to understand there's a lot of preclinical and a lot of work that's done to show the proof of principle that this strategy is going to be helpful to our patients. And then ultimately, we test them in clinical trials. And so I think that that strategy is one that is still being tested. And it will be very important to look at populations of patients um, to see how they do in general. Uh, so I think that that is a very exciting approach and one that is continuing to be explored. Um, and another extension of the other question, someone's asking about, um, does this extend to oligos too? Mm -hmm. Okay. Okay. So that's a really good question. Um, what is exciting, I think, in neuro-oncology right now? In fact, I think in Amsterdam as we speak, or um, in Europe, the pathologists, the neuropathologists over the world are getting together, I think it might be next week, to actually convene this very important uh, meeting to talk about IDH mutation, oligodendroglioma, and I'm sure you're all aware about the 1P19Q co-deletion. Um, so it, we're learning that even though the pathologist might tell us this is a grade 2 astrocytoma or grade 2 oligodendroglioma, we can go beyond that and actually talk about the biology and the cytogenetics. And in fact, patients with oligodendroglioma that have the 1P19Q co-deletion, we know are, have a better outcome. They seem to be very responsive to radiation and chemotherapy. And in fact, in that population of patients, the use of chemotherapy in conjunction with radiation, certainly in the grade 3 oligodendroglioma, there has been now um, two reports in the literature about these large randomized trials that were done many, many years ago, I think 15 years ago, that have now shown that in that subset of patients with oligodendroglioma who have the co-deletion of 1P and 19Q, that the addition of chemotherapy to radiation just about doubles the survival. And, and that's almost unheard of in oncology, that you can get that kind of an effect. But that is what we're seeing, is that the patients with oligodendroglioma seem to have very, very chemosensitive tumors and benefit from using chemotherapy in conjunction with radiation. Now, the studies that were done were so long ago, the drugs that were used were the three drugs called PCV, procarbazine, CCNU, and vincristine. And once Timidar was, was used, uh, you know, in 2005, from 2005 on, uh, because it's so much easier to tolerate and easier on the bone marrow in terms of side effects, most of the onco neuro-oncologists have not been using PCV. Um, but the studies now have matured enough, long enough, that the, the survival data supports the use of a nitrosuria or base chemotherapy with radiation in the upfront setting. Whether temozolomide, which is a cytotoxic agent, just like CCNU and procarbazine and vincristine, whether that can replace PCV as a standard, that study is actually being tested internationally right now where patients are being randomized to either uh, radiation and PCV versus radiation and temozolomide. There's also an arm of temozolomide only for patients trying to spare the effects of radiation. And so the strategies of maximal safe resection, radiation, and chemotherapy are still important for tumors, especially tumors like oligodendroglioma. Whether there are specific targeted therapies, that um, we would be able to develop uh, is still yet to be seen. All IDH uh, patients, I mean, that's the 1P90Q co-deleted patients with oligodendroglioma are all IDH mutated. So they, again, you, you have a similar idea of targeting IDH as a, as a potential uh, therapeutic approach. Sounds like an exciting study. Um, Person's asking about using turmeric. 
um, in addition to diet, do you have any expertise in that area at all? Uh, I don't have any expertise in specifically uh, dietary supplements, um, so I wouldn't want to comment on that. But you know, a lot of uh, the approach is a balanced diet, um, sort of not excessive uh, in terms of, for example, vitamins, and uh, that's how I would approach things. I would you know balanced diet, um, staying away from carbohydrates and a lot of fats, sort of focusing on good fats, um, good protein. I, I'm, I'm, I can't really comment on any specific uh, dietary supplements that I would recommend to you. Thanks. I know you're an advocate of being involved with your healthcare team. Um, if someone is asking about, you know, when you go to the doctor, how do you know the right questions to ask? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Where would you start with that? Well, it depends on where you are in the trajectory of the, your illness. So what I see, of course, is when patients first get diagnosed, it's so overwhelming um, in terms of all the questions that you need to ask. I mean. You know, as you all know, you're healthy. You're you're faced with now a very serious diagnosis. You're thrown into a hospital where there's a huge team of doctors and and nurses and social workers and a lot of healthcare professionals that all of a sudden are part of your care. Um, and then and then you have to grapple with what is a type of tumor. Uh, what are the options for treatment? What are the side effects? How is this going to affect my life? And then you have to think to yourself, what are your goals? What's important to you? How do you bring that to the discussion of um, the decision of how to move forward? And that can be very, very uh, overwhelming for patients and caregivers. Uh, I would reach out to the ABTA, for example, to look for. They're, they have a lot of very good literature about things. Um, we actually have developed a caregiver manual. I believe it's on the ABTA website. And it has in there sort of questions that you should be thinking about um, once you understand a little bit about the disease itself. Uh, ASCO.net is another very good resource uh, that links to the ABTA resources. And in, in that um, website, you can see sort of, again, questions that, to think about. So, Getting educated about just the nature of the tumor, the types of treatments, um, the fact that you're all participating in this webinar is, is, is a testament to the fact that you want to empower yourself with information. Um, and so I think tap into those resources as well. Um, and, and check out with your healthcare team who can help you with various questions. You know who is the appropriate person to call? Who is the appropriate person to to contact if you had questions? So, for example, if it's about the incision or the operation, obviously that's the surgeon. If it's about uh, side effects of chemotherapy, that would be your neuro oncology team. But then there are sort of the matter of fact things like my insurance and other practical aspects. And uh, you know we here at UCSF have a neuro oncology caregiver team that we've developed. Um, to help with answering a lot of those other questions as well. But I think most times the kinds of things that the patient, um, when you're faced with a tumor, the questions would be, what are my options? Uh, what are the risks, side effects? What can I hope that would happen as a result of this treatment? Um, and you know, uh, what support is there going to be for me and my family? What about clinical trials? I mean, those are all sort of the basic questions that you could start, you know, thinking about when you plan to see your doctor. That's wonderful. And you, I think you just gave us the best plug ever because you are correct. Um, at our website, uh, in our About Brain Tumors, we do have a section that includes questions to ask your healthcare team. So thank you very much. So if you go to www.abta.org, and you look under brain tumor information, um, and you do see our publication called About Brain Tumors. 
um, you will see in the back, back of the publication questions to ask. And we absolutely will send you copies of that free of charge. Also, as you mentioned, yes, we do have the caregiver manual at our website, um, also abta.org. And under caregiver information, um, the caregiver manual is downloadable as a PDF. But again, we will, you know, if you call us on our 800 line, 800-886-2282, we will send you a hard copy so you don't have to print out the whole caregiver manual. So thank you, Dr. Chang. It's almost like I planted you in the audience to um, <laughs> answer those questions. So it was perfect. No, um, I'm I I think that everybody should really, um, of course, you're all on the webinar series, so you know what's available at ABTA, but really go into their website and, and see all the links that are there and the resources that are there. Perfect. We are a little bit past the hour, so I thank everyone for staying with us. There were so many good questions. Um, I think it was absolutely well worth it. Um, so thank you, Dr. Chang, and for more information on treatment, um, again, we have tumor and treatment information at our website. Um, so we're going to pause for one moment, and we are going to stop recording.